Welcome all to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. This week, I went to a really good friend of mine that when I was starting up, coming up, he was instrumental in helping myself, many people as well, stateside and UK side. Um, house music was just beginning, basically, as what we knew it. It was a time where it was in its early stages. People were just, you know, catching on that they can get a drum machine and a sampler and you didn't have to be musically trained, but if you had a good ear, you could put things together. I was one of those guys that was part of that scene coming up, but I was also DJing in New York and I was talking with him every week over that long thing, that old thing called a landline phone that uses pre cell phones. And if you own the cell phone in those days, you were a rich man because you couldn't afford to have a cell phone, especially calling from New York to the UK. But this man created such, such a legacy that he had some of the best residencies that anyone would drool or pine over. Okay? Being Ministry of Sound, Pasha and Ibiza. He has went to 85 or 90 countries and played dance music, helped launch people's careers through his backing financially, if it was not mentally helping people. He was just there and ran a phenomenal record shop that serviced a hell of a lot of great DJs in the UK and the world because he did a lot of mail order in those days when mail order was a thing to do. So... I am not going to hold back any further because we've been waiting to get this man up. I'd like to introduce our brother, the godfather of UK House, Mr. Jazzy M. (laughs) 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 Jazzy, they're lining up right now, man. They're coming through those doors. They're coming. I'm watching the numbers go up as they go. Here they come in. Jazzy, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm going to say this to you. We are so privileged and so happy to have you join us. How the hell are you and how are you handling COVID? Before we even get into the story. Oh, I- COVID. Yeah. Uh, handle it. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Lenny. And thank you for being patient. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me on here. Um, I'm handling it well. I'm feeling well. And I'm really, really glad to be on this amazing show. I've been watching so many of them, man, and uh, taking them all in. And, you know, the stories are phenomenal, aren't they? And you you really do have something quite unique. So thank you, <laughs> is what I'd like to say to begin with. You're welcome. Um, I don't know where to start. I suppose the best place to always start is at the beginning, yeah? Well, before we even go to the beginning, let's just make sure. Okay. How are you coping with COVID and everything? Because it's been a rough for every everybody likes to know how everybody's doing out there. You know, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. You know, uh, got, um, my, um, jabs and, you know, double jabbed up. Um, you know, I've been working in the background as well with, um, I, I'm not really going to go too, too deeply into it, but been working in the background with, uh, various, uh, night places and dealing with, you know, with COVID, uh, in the areas that, that I've been, uh, sort of like living in and you know out here i'm i'm out in east anglia by the way so you know out in the east part of uh, england so yeah coping really well um thankfully never got any touch or sign of it we we had a bit of a scare i've i've got a son he's 16 now maybe might have had a, a slight touch of it a couple of years ago when you know when it first kind of uh, dare i say kicked in or we we was made aware of it um and yeah that was that was horrible i w- we'll never know whether he actually had it or not or you know or it was just a really bad dose of, of flu but there was obviously not much known about it what i will say though is in, in when i've been traveling um you know this whole kind of covid thing i was telling somebody the story the other day of uh you know when we were traveling and and first getting temperature things put on our head to read our temperature and you was hearing things something uh called bird flu 
And then um, maybe a few years later, and still carrying on with traveling, it was uh, then it was called SARS. And and then now eventually we have uh, the latest ordeal, COVID. But yeah, I I can say that I'm, you know, m- myself and my family and and everybody, pretty much that I know. Uh, I've got a friend in New York who who had it really really bad, and he was putting up daily posts on Facebook. And he got up to day 128. So I know that he really, really suffered. He's now thankfully okay and, you know, well, uh, still suffering maybe with a touch of long COVID. But, yeah, it's it's a very real thing. Uh, and I'm just glad that I, you know, kind of like, but it, it's not over yet. It's not gone away. But we're dealing yeah. okay. But you know what? It's, it's sad that you say that, and that's right. It hasn't gone away. No. And I sometimes think people think it has. Like it's yeah. still all around us. It's crazy. Yeah. It's definitely still around us. I mean, obviously here in the UK, we've got the the winters. You know, winters on its way. Uh, I don't know why I laughed there, but winter is definitely on its way. And it's inevitable. It's an ine- inevitable yeah. thing that's coming, right? Yeah. Um, just had a, dare I say, a slight dose of euphoria with the fact that we've, you know, gigs have opened up and I've, you know, just very recently played a few. Congrats, brother. Thank Congratulations. You. We did see and we were all thrilled for you. We were applauding yeah. you right where you needed to be. Yeah. And and you know what? The, the feeling is it's just amazing. You know, when I was joking with you earlier saying house is a feeling. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and it was it was a great feeling. Good feeling to be up there. Good feeling to feel the the whole sort of tribalistic feel of of people of of energy of, of what they give to you while you're giving to them. Correct. Basically, well said and well put, my brother. Thank you. Yeah. And you and you know what? If anyone has that knowledge and historical value and where it's coming from, I'm going to now say Jazzy M has has those assets. <laughs> <laughs> Jazzy, let's get right into it, baby. Okay. I ask um, everyone because you got a big story ahead, and I know we've been preparing. We got pictures, we got puppets, everybody. We got all kinds yeah. of stuff. He's got all kinds of stuff he's gonna be showing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Jazzy, I ask everybody so, a question, you know, and I'm then I'm gonna let you run. You know, how does music find you, brother? Where does it start for you? Well, it's it started in um in the UK, I was born in 1962. So I'm really pleased because obviously, again, saying earlier to you, this is edition 62 of True House Stories. So it, that's really cool for me. January the 5th, 1962. Um, grew up in an area for a few years called North London, that area, and then moved to Southwest London, where I started to, like most people, most kids go to school, uh, primary school, met a, met a very close friend called Dean. He became my brother from another mother. He, and the reason for the reason I speak, speak about Dean in this way is that he, he was the one that really kind of introduced me to music. First of all, uh, he was, he was the kind of kid that was into, you know, like the next thing. Well, kids today, they've, they've got, you know, technology around them, and it's, but you still do have fads and fashions, yes? But obviously back in those days, we, we had less, but we, you know, like say you'd have like thin corduroys or winkle pickers or a style of hair or a style of music, and he would be on that trend. So he was kind of like finger on the pulse. And the reason I say that is he's the one that kind of introduced me to certain styles and types of music. I got a bit older. We sort of went uh, separate ways. We still kept in touch. And I kind of started to then listen. My taste in music started to become more into, dare I say, it was melodic. It was always been kind of deeper melodic. So be it rock, progressive rock, um, you know, soulful. And then somebody introduced me to something called Parliament, funkadelic and it changed me i don't know quite what changed inside my dna but as soon as i heard that it was tear the roof off the <laughs> tear the roof and i just i lost it to something that was 
I always call it now to the left side of me. I don't know why I use that term, but it was on the left side of me. And it was like almost like having two people into music. Like I had this kind of more deep and, uh, you know, so, so I loved things like Pink Floyd. I always liked the more melodic, bluesy kind of music. Yeah. And then Parliament, and, and it was very different. And I think by saying that, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that then later on, as you kind of progressively got into dance music, dare I say, and Parliament was, they did make dance music. I mean, Funkadelic, you know, certainly did. Um, I got into the 4-4 the four, four beat. I, I started to go dancing um, on a Sunday with some a family that lived down my road. And we used to go to a nightclub and we'd go on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I, I don't know what age I was, but I was young, all right? And th this family was like, you know, like the Brady Punch. There was like, bop, 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 you know, like you had the young... Or, of the Jacksons, so like you're know, all the way up to the top, yeah. They're about seven brothers, and they looked after me. And they took me to this nightclub in Richmond called Cheeky Pete's, and we used to do this thing called Sunday dancing. And that's really and truly was my introduction uh, to disco, disco funk, jazz funk, you name it. That and the the sense that obviously we was listening to something called pirate radio, which obviously then became very prominent later on in my life. I was still very young then, but I'm talking about the whole idea of suddenly becoming introduced to that four, four beat strings, drums, you, you name it. And you, there was the, do you, sorry. Do you remember the record would have been like a standout for you at that time? Any records particularly? I, I, I loved Gene Chandler, Get Down, on 20th Century Fox. Oh, my God, I remember the label. So, yeah, Get Down. Um, there was a real commercial one called uh, Contact by Edwin Starr. Um, Sealy B and the Buzzy Bunch. Um, oh, God, so many. T Connection. I mean, I mean, some of, obviously the bigger, so there's some bigger sounds, but I was into, you know, obviously you know, maybe more underground as well. We had uh, Radio Invicta, um, and there was uh, quite a uh, famous DJ that he got, he got obviously claimed to fame, was quite called Steve Walsh was on there. But there was also, a, um, rest in peace, Steve, uh, there was also a DJ called Steve Devon that, that's not spoken about as much, and I loved this guy. Devon, I think, is the right pronunciation. I might be wrong but it is going back. I love this guy's shows. He was more funky. And I think I just, I sort of fell in love with those rolling bass lines, funky B lines. Yeah. Definitely a forte that I love and kind of took me into my, like further into my DJ career. Cause I, I, even when I was playing house in clubs, I always loved the dubs more. Don't get me wrong. I like vocals, but I just, they were more clubby to me. You, you get me? But then when you would, would drop into a vocal, it lifts because you've gone boom, 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 boom and then suddenly, way, you know, there's the song. And that's, that's the style and fashion that I first saw from Frankie Knuckles, a kind of American style. But I've, got, I've now whoo, shot ahead, so I'll come back. Um, where was I? We were 20th century Gene Chandler, and you were Gene Chandler, family. yeah. <laughs> you had the family with the Brady Bunch, all dancing. Yeah, they were, they were called the Burnhams. They 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 really looked after me. Yeah, the Burnhams, Victor, Michael. If you're listening, any of you guys listening, love you. Thank you. They they properly looked after me, and we, as I say, we. I don't know. I don't know how long it was. It was kind of formation dancing as well. You know, real disco dancing. So um, I don't know if I was any good at it, but I really enjoyed it. It was something to to really understand and, and enjoy. Um, we did, you know, we didn't come from a, a really what I call a affluent background. So you know, just working class kids all, all doing their thing. You know, 
and, and that was something to really savor. Well, being that everything was so simple back then, yeah, you know, that we all talk about that. How there was, you know, there was no such thing as cable TV, internet, no. uh, all this extra. You had four or five radio stations, three channels of television and music. Yeah. We we had a, a TV that you used to put money in. <laughs> And I, I, I am not lying. You know, click and t to get the picture on. That's uh, that's something that I really do remember. Black and white telly like that. Even remember the name of the company, Reader Fusion. But uh, again, um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't have a lot of entertainment, did we? So I think going out and doing that was was great fun. Um, certainly better than say uh, school. I didn't really do school discos or anything like that, but. Uh, the, the thing is, is that the, the club that I went to as well was, uh, you know, became quite prominent in my sort of uh, going out time as, as a youngster. That and uh, a wine bar that was uh, where I grew up in, in Putney called McCorber's, which is a funny name. But uh, and I eventually became a DJ there. I, I pestered the D as you do when you're young, going out, thinking you're so cool because you're underage, you know, and pestering a DJ. Because you're thinking, damn, he's playing some serious, serious tunes, you know. And, of course, the more you're listening to the, these DJs, because although we had pirate radio, pirate radio would be getting taken off the air, Lenny. In in the UK, there was, you know, the, the DTI would be coming and finding wherever they, you know, the, the studio or the link to the studio was and chopping down that mask and see ya. You know, then yes, they'd be off. That pirate thing. Did anyone, mm. you know, get arrested for that stuff? I do believe that somebody, uh, I think um, a really dear friend of mine, because uh, I've got to mention him uh, when we was on LWS, Jasper. I think Jasper got caught once. I don't quite know what happened to him. Jasper the Vinyl Junkie, by the way. Peter, shouts to you, man. Um, I think he got caught once. I, luckily, was never caught. Um, we, we did, and we did have a what I call that two year period, which in a way fashioned um, house music in them earlier days. Because having a two year stint, imagine it on pirate radio playing exactly what you wanted to do, really did grow quite quickly. But yeah, I think people did get arrested. Uh, I certainly know the horror stories of people having, imagine this, Lenny, having your records actually confiscated and never to be seen again. So it wasn't... Uh, Talk about gut -wrenching, a gut-wrenching feeling. It's like someone took your guts and went... Bruh! Yeah. Right? How, how important was that? You know, you got to explain that. Your record collection was everything. I don't know. I mean, because I was never caught, I don't know how I would have reacted, but I most probably would have act ended up into a cell or something because I know I would have gone crazy, man. I mean, look at them all. You know, you wouldn't, you would not be wanting anyone to take your vinyl. That's for sure. Well, let me so. give you perspective. Back in the day when we had flight cases and your, yeah. and your records didn't make it to the yeah. gig, how did you feel? I don't even want to talk about oh, there you go. it. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and you eventually got them, but you know what I mean? That feeling of, you felt like something was taken from you. Like, Oh my God, yeah. now what do you do? Right. Yeah. I, I once saw the lid of one of my boxes come up on the conveyor. It's not, it's absolute true story in, in Madrid. I don't know what it was about, and, and, and sorry, Madrid Airport, but I don't know what it was about Madrid Airport, but I had a few, oh, we're going back a bit, obviously, a few boxes do, you know, went. And I had a lid come up once, no, nothing else, just the lid. So, uh, yeah, was, wasn't too happy because those were the days as well, Lenny. I don't know if you remember, we had, the, we had two sizes, didn't we, really? We had the smaller flight case box. And we had the Monty one, which would hold oh, just about a, a, a hundred vinyl, which made you strong. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Backs later, everyone, and surgeries and all that. We carried records around the world. All of us. We carried records around the world. 
It's it's not like nowadays where they, it almost makes you feel guilty when you just walk in with a, a USB. Is that all yeah, you I have? still can't get used to it, man. Is that all you have is your headphone and your USB yeah. stick? Yeah. What it I'm is. trying to look for one now. I haven't got one near me, but don't yeah. Worry. Just, they all know what it is. You don't even need to know it. Yeah, they don't need to be shown a goddamn USB, but yeah. yeah. So on the road, to, go ahead. Go so on. on your road, on your road that, you know, from pirate radio and all that, keep on keep us keep us locked in. So, right. So the roads, well, I as I say, going back to partly growing up, doing the dance, da 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 da, da starting to get older. Uh, and then finding my my feet in this little wine bar, Macorbus, and it's really cool because I've owned I haven't even got that in my notes, so I'm glad that I've just remembered Macorbus wine bar. Um, I got a little stint. I got a shout to Steve as well um, from from Macorbus because he's a really dear old friend of mine from them days. Uh, and Dudley, it, oh God, I don't know what ever happened today. I, I can't say second names because I can't remember them, but uh, they know who they are. These were early influences to, to me, way, way pre before Jazzy M days. Uh, my first touch of pirate radio, dare I say, was I met up with a few guys, as you do, in, in, in a, uh, a public house in, in Putney. Not re- I was never, one thing I've got to say, I was never really big into drinking or, or drinking culture. So it's never, never really a big thing f- for me, yeah? So, but just go there, socialise, met a few guys, la, la, la. Next thing you know, we all got the same, oh, you go down McCall, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, because really and truly where I was, that area of London at that time, and it wasn't really known for any really true nightlife. The only nightlife that was really going on in London would have been the West End at that time. And I certainly not anything really crazy, special or underground, that's for sure. So um, I met this guy, and he was running a pirate station out of Fulham. And guess what? It was called Radio Fulham. So shouts to Mark if you're listening, because he basically started me. That's where I started. I started on a, on a small station called uh, Radio Fulham. Uh, Shore Olds Road, if anyone knows it in Fulham, it's, that's where we were, in a great big house. He had no link, i.e. if the DTI did come out, they would have just come down, kicked the door in, and that would have been the end of you, you know? Uh, I didn't know about them, then I was seriously green as far as anything to do with uh, Pirate was concerned, so just did my show. I was called DJ Mick, which is not... The, the best name <laughs> that's, that's really all I could think of at the time and uh, where, did get, like, where did he get Nick from? Like Nick Michael J- I know it's Michael of course yeah they sorry say, we're going to ring you as we're going to call we, you have been bestowed DJ Nick oh god I know I know it was um, god I've never told anyone that and there I am telling the world that's quite funny um but yeah, that that's really that's where it began. And but you know what was cool, Lenny? They put parties on, and there was a hotel over in near High Street, just around the back of High Street. So it's South Ken, I think. Don't ask me the name of the hotel. Anyway, and we we were gathered. We were getting about seven or eight hundred people coming to these parties, man. And I was thinking, this station is only reaching around like had like three five mile radius, but there was people coming, and I was can imagine these early early days. I was like, wow, this is so cool. So. After getting that taste of like playing it, and of course the the, uh, the wine bar as well, I had I had a regular. I think I was a resident. I was doing a regular until someone asked me to play Sinatra, and that's when I sort of said that was the end of that. Uh, I won't tell you what the guy said. He he was fresh out of prison and he became the new manager. See, I've gone off on a tangent now, but that is definitely okay. that is definitely the sort of thing that that used to sort of like you know. You're more up against, I think, them early days with the, the you know, the people that manage or, or, or were in charge because they didn't really want uh, dance music so much. You know, he, go, he used to say, "Ain't you got any Sinatra?" I go, "No, no, I don't have that." 
So, um, and of course we were playing, you know, funky soul, disco. We were playing all kinds of stuff. You know, it wasn't obviously really and truly, dare I say, mixing per se. It was more just cutting them in, playing them out, cutting them in, playing them out. You know, there was, there were no decks or mixers at that time really to be even talking about as far as, you know, what I call American mixing was concerned, you know. Right. Was that uh, around the time of Soul Sonic Force? That or was that pre Soul Sonic Force era? Um I think it was uh, pre. I think it was pre. See, this is this is where it all for me, to even preparing for the show, you know, the gray area is only what I was saying about like the time the time structure of where everything began and you know, and and, and learning. I was talking about a, a little reference there about Frankie Knuckles and that, you know, that style of mixing that I'd never see or heard before. That influence it had on me was so major of hearing this tune that you knew and you think, hold on a minute, well, that's going on a lot longer than what I remember. And of course, yeah, he's, what he's done is obviously mixed a dub into a vocal or, or vice versa. Um, but a gentleman that... Um, Going back a little bit to one of the um, places that I worked, which, as you said about, you know, the, the Richie Rich story, was a place called Spinoffs. And when I worked there, I worked for an American, the, the guy that owned it was an American DJ called Greg James. We have, I think we have a Greg James over here, um, works on radio, but not the same one. So, uh, but Greg... Uh, was brought in as an import himself to work a big major club. Oh, I got the spin. Let's show everybody that flyer. I found it. The spin off. Oh. Look at that, everybody. On <laughs> Palace Road. Okay. I know Richie. I, I know Richie won't be listening, but shouts to Roger if you're listening, my man. Richie, Love Richie, Roger bit, yeah. Johnson. Richie, yep, Richie, yep. Roger Johnson too. Two, um, both famous for, for DMC mixing world championships. Big ups. Yeah. And, and Greg runs, uh, ran spin. I mean, and of course being American and very slick and having, this is, this is how, this is where it all truly, went. this is the, the nitty gritty of how we, I became like one of the first in the sense of bringing house music through because Greg's connection is, you know, all about connections. We're prone at the fact that we, at those times, record stores in the UK, and of course I can only really speak for London, but they had to have people uh, called importers, you know, very much the same. You, you know, these, these companies would be importing the vinyl. And then they'd bring it round to your your record store and sell it into you. You'd be like standing there, big, big fat pile. This is what's new this week. La la la. And everyone that's that's run run a record store will know exactly what I'm talking about. And people and the punters will they'll they'll know as well because they're the people that be waiting there for them imports to come and go. Yeah yeah yeah, that band's going to come in. You know about whatever. Yeah. Well, that's the way it ran. A little bit later on, but not for us as spin-offs because Greg knew them importers uh, or those exporters, I should say, in New York. One of them began with W. I can't actually again remember the, the thing. And... There you go. Oh yeah, you're from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so as he's doing what he's, I know exactly. He said W. I went what yeah. everybody. So thank you, Jazzy. So he. That's cool. He knew the direct in. He had the direct inroads with the American guys out of New York, the exporters. Basically. He had the inroads, yeah. And of course, you know what it's about. If you've got contacts, then you you know you use them. And Greg, his whole pedigree was disco. And in his office, in spinoffs, he had like you know a plethora of 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 signed photos of you know of covers grace jones van mccoy i could go on luther van, everyone greg was in over over your side of the pond was uh, maybe i don't know whether he was a celeb or whatever but he was definitely down 
I know, because the thing is, it is a very underground, like nobody's really heard of, of Greg James, yeah? No. Know him. I don't know him. But, but the thing is, is Greg was brought over to play the Embassy Cup. This, as far as I know, he could have been spinning me a big yarn, but I don't know. But the, but the, but the, uh, the proof was in the pudding as far as his um, contacts was concerned, because... Lo and behold, every single week we was getting those fresh imports and we were getting them way before anyone else. Uh, cue the whole idea of the fact that we were starting to get imports in quicker. Now, that, that time, obviously, house as really and truly didn't exist, you know, in the sense of like anyone even knew that word. Um, you know what I mean? What was it being called coming over? Or was it just, it was a category? It, just would have been an, it would have been a record import. It would have been a dance record. And, and of course, my ears suddenly went, <laughs> I, I remember Greg's face as well, because he was a true, you know, true blue disco, you know, love disco, da, da, da. And I was saying, wow, this is seriously raw. Wow, it sounds so underproduced, but it's got some drive what's that what's that you know and of course you know we're listening to early electronic drum machines we're not listening to super smooth strings or orchestrations we're listening to electronic music early early electronic music cue then the fact please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to and please do not forget to follow us.